Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> before we go on, um, I just wanted to give you a little, you know, this is kind of our anniversary for us. We've been officially in business two years, but this is where we get to report our year and what we've done, and it's been an amazing year. Um, before I do, and Mr. Alalde, who, by the way, is the chairman of the Workforce Investment Board. He's not just a guy that works there. He's a pretty awesome dude. We love him. But there's some, you know, Inland Empire has some pretty bad statistics. We are pretty much the worst in the nation for a lot of things, which is why uh, we have so much of a need in our community. Um, we have a 38% dropout rate in kids, just in general, out here. And if you're a foster, that goes up to 46%. Which, you know, for, for, you know, a future, that's pretty di dismal. Because like I tell my students, today we have a global economy and a master's degree is like a high school diploma anymore. You're not competing with the guy next door. You're competing with the guy in China and Russia, India and anywhere else who will come out here and do the same job and has probably got a master's degree. So that's number one. So not graduating from high school is pretty, pretty huge. Um, we know we have about a 15% unemployment rate, but if you go out to Coachella, which we're doing a lot of work out there, we're up to 50%. And if you're a teenager, like Rick was saying, it's 50%. There's no jobs. Uh, we know 15% of the homeless children and 40% of, of a, there's 15% of the homeless are children and 40% adults right now fear they could be homeless. All it takes is losing a job and they don't have the skills. This one shocks me. We have a 50% teen birth rate between 15 and 19. That is shocking to me. And that is simple education. But not only that, um, a statistic I heard at a county meeting not too long ago was 50% 50, 50 of junior high school girls in Paris right now are pregnant. That's astronomical. And that is a cyclical thing because then we have the welfare and it repeats, and it repeats, and it repeats, and it gets bigger and bigger, and it's mushroom clouding. And that's what's happening right now. 80% um, of those in foster care will lose their child back into foster care. So it just gets worse. Um, like Rick was saying, 2% of foster care, care actually go to college. Even though they have the opportunity to, and there's actually funding, they aren't told of the opportunities. They don't even know. Or they don't think that they can. They don't have the support system in place to encourage them to go. And he said it was abysmal. I don't remember the last stats, but it's a very, very small percentage of the community actually goes to college, even though they can. And the schools, especially community colleges, are overloaded. And I can tell you that's true because I teach them, and I am the nice one. I always let my wait list go, and I have right now 89 students in my online site class. And it's supposed to cap out at 50. So, you know, it's, it's pretty tough. 65% of emancipated fosters are homeless within 18 months. Up to 60% of those incarcerated right now do not have a high school diploma. And one stat I heard from a CASA report was 70% of those incarcerated were once in foster care. Due to the stress of jobs, we're, okay, we're working a lot with migrant farm workers now because we're going out to Coachella. So I just found this statistic today due to the stress on the jobs and the stress of financial pressures, 26.7% of incidences like psychotic, psychiatric and psychotic disorders happen in male immigrant farm workers right now. It's just so hard on them. And 62% of people right now in Riverside County are low to moderate income, and it's getting worse because of the economy. So those are some, some things I wanted you guys to see, the challenges we're facing as an organization and as a community. Okay. So who are we? <laughs> well, we're a 501c3, and we got that in three weeks, which is pretty astronomical. It's pretty amazing, and we were able to do that because of the fact that we showed the IRS just some of those statistics and how big the need was in our community. So we were able to get that in three weeks, which is pretty amazing. It takes people six months to a year to do that. Uh, we serve at-risk and undeserved populations throughout the Inland Empire, and that's a big area, if you're not, I'm sure you guys all know, but we're, we're asked to go out to Salton Sea. We're all over the place. Um, now, here's the important word, free. We don't charge for what we do. That's why you guys are here, and that's why we do fundraising. We 
you know, and we have contracts with some organizations, but for the most part, what we offer the community is free. They can come to us and get, a, in a lot of cases, the same training they can at some of these, you know, technical schools and what, what, what have you for pretty much, you know, for, for free <laughs> for the most part. But we believe that through training and education, that's what reduces these at-risk behaviors. We don't believe that. Do we? we know this. <laughs> okay. So what have we accomplished the first year? Last year, you guys came, and we have half the amount of people. So like Dr. Grossman was saying, we expect for this to grow and grow and grow and grow. And we're excited that we were able to double our people this year. But on a very small budget, and when I say small budget, I mean small budget. <laughs> you know, uh, only a handful of people actually get paid at our organization. The rest are volunteers, including myself. Uh, many of us have full-time jobs and do other things. But on a very small budget, we served 100 people in the first year. That may not seem like a lot to you, but it's a lot. It is a lot. Um, we created a dynamic program that has become so well received. It started out with our life skills, but that is just really mushroomed, and we've really fine-tuned it. And also our collaborations. We have collaborations with a lot of organizations and people. For example, Rebecca back there, she is at Lincoln High School. She was one of the first ones that took a chance on us and let us do a class at her school, and we're still doing it. And over here we have folks from the Youth Opportunity Centers that, that we're working with. And those collaborations are everything, like uh, Councilman Davis said. They're, they're everything. We all kind of lean on each other for different stuff because without each other, we can't do it all. Um, and we doubled the size of our organizational, organization's ability and funding streams. Would you say something more specific about the dynamic program that you created? Just so we're received? <laughs> okay. Our dynamic program was to start out with life skills. Our life skills class has a financial literacy component. Then it has the resume development, the career development, educational plan, and, and, and uh, resume development. So by the time they leave, they know how to handle their money. Hopefully, they do. They have a resume. They know how to handle themselves. They have a plan, a clear path on where they're going to go, and an education plan. And I'm going to hit the statistics on what they do learn in a few minutes. But that's our program. Of, uh, we've done some measurable stuff this year. We're going to measure even more in the coming year. But this is what we saw in the first, well, really six months. It blew us away. Um, in, the in the completion of our 10-week life skills program, we saw a 26% increase in overall career development self-efficacy. That's confidence. That's, uh, you know, just how they felt about their careers. We saw a 26% increase in career problem-solving confidence an increase in career planning confidence, and as you can see, increases across the board. But what I love is they saw a 37.5% decrease in what they perceived as barriers to achieve what they wanted to do. You know, as a psychologist, it's all in here for the most part, what you believe. That's what self-efficacy means. It's our confidence based on what we believe. Um, we saw a 37.5% decrease. That's huge in 10 weeks. That's huge. And they saw a 13.32 increase, percent increase in overall perceived wealth or self-worth, just how they perceived themselves. They felt like they were more valued. That's huge. To me as a psychologist, that's what it's about. If they can leave our programs and feel good about themselves and that they have chances and opportunities and we've done our job, that's what we're in it for. So I did do some pretty little graphs based on the, Lindsay does all our stats now, she plugs all these in, and we get these pretty little graphs, but but this is basically uh, graphical pictures of what we do. Um, of those career development self-efficacy, these are all the, you can see the increases. Okay. There's our increase in um, self-value and self-worth, which is my favorite. And then um, we have the decrease in what they perceived as barriers. Okay. But what we're going to start measuring now and what I'm really excited about to being able to report back to you next time as we've started questioning even deeper because, as you know, we went from youth to all populations. So that increased what we could test for and what we could measure. So now we're going to ch I'll be able to tell you next year the age groups, the genders, ethnicities, education level, employment rates, dropout rates, family size, teen birth rate, income level, all these wonderful things. And why do we have to do this? Well, it's not because I want to dig into people's lives, but number one, this tells us what we need to do as an organization. 
but also this is what we're asked to provide to get funding. They want to know these things. Who are you serving? Why are you serving? What are they doing? And, you know, um, you know right now, age, gender, ethnicity, and um, foster demographics, those are all very important in income levels. So I get to report those to you next time, and I'm excited. Okay. So how have we changed? Our board's been working, and we've been responding to basically the needs that have come up. And am I working? And... Uh, so in doing so, we've had to make some changes. We amended our bylaws to include all populations and age groups. If you were around in the beginning, we were focusing on foster. Then we added youth. Now we're adding everybody because everybody needs it. And we found that our programs span all age groups and all um, economic areas and every kind of thing. So we expanded our services. Also, we've been asked to work out in L.A. County. Orange County, and like I said, we're, we're looking into San Diego as well. So we're expanding. The word's getting out. <laughs> Wait, was I done? <laughs> okay. And we have, add more diverse class times because we have now, we're doing adults, so we have folks coming in the evenings to classes and um, taking, you know, opportunities to, to, to learn more. Okay, now you can go. Okay. So other things we're working on. We're trying to get WASC accredited. That's going to be a big job, but it's a huge deal, and here's why. Because that means we are an accredited you know, training program. We can create certification programs. We can create you know, any kind of credit program. So I am working on that now, now that we're getting settled enough to do that. And uh, I hope to be able next year to tell you we are WASC accredited. And if anyone knows me, it's going to happen. Um, by next week, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, we're teaming with other organizations, and based on my basic stats, minimum, we're probably going to serve 500 people that year, or this coming year, in 2011, from our 100 to, our, to 500. And if it goes the way it looks like it might, it could be up to 1,500 people. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge. So that's why I need you guys. <laughs> um, more computers, Dan. <laughs> um, uh, we're offering classes in more locations, more flexible times. Um, we're growing our team to accommodate this need. Now, that's one thing I always say. Many of us are volunteers, like I said, but I need to pay my instructors. They do, they're the ones out on the front lines doing the work, and I like to pay my instructors. Um, and would you stop? <laughs> and job placement. We're looking at doing that, too, adding some job placements for our participants. Uh, these are some of the new classes we're adding to our repertoire. We're going to start doing ESL, citizenship. We're already doing CompTIA and Office, basic computers. We're going to start the job loss recovery program, smart communication. We're doing goal setting, small business, small business marketing and strategizing, leadership development and parenting. Those are just some of the things we're adding. So that's why we need instructors. That's why we need funding. And our team, they're the best. I had them all stand up, but I just wanted to tell you who they all are. Um, and uh, Angelica couldn't be here today, but these are all our great team of the people that make this happen. And like I said, we're adding more. And our board, Councilman Davis talked about that. This is our current board and our advisory board, but I do need more people. We're getting bigger, we're growing, and I need dynamic people who want to be on our board and really not just be on the board. I mean, I get a lot of people who want to be on the board, but who want to work on the board. Being on a board is a responsibility. It's a responsibility to fundraise, a responsibility to network, and it's not just something to put on your resume, especially our organization. If you really want to help, we're looking for people because I need help. We all need help. We all can't do it ourselves. So we are recruiting, and if you're interested, you can let me know. And most important, well, you wanted to touch on this. I'll leave this for you, but we got some really great awards this year. We're very proud of it. And... Uh, I'll let you touch on it. And I want to thank you guys for all being here. I appreciate everything that you guys do to support us. Thank you.